obviously appropriate that we honor the people buried here. One of the first memorials to enslaved people in the United States is the flat stone over there, and it reflects the time it was placed there, 1929. It reads, in memory of the many faithful colored servants of the Washington family buried at Mount Vernon from 1760 to 1860. Their unidentified remains surround this spot. But despite that recognition, this burial ground remained neglected, forgotten, really, until 1982, when the local black community focused renewed attention on this site, resulting in this 1983 memorial, where each year the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and a group called Black Women United for Action bring together descendants of enslaved people, not just here at Mount Vernon, but other colonial mid-Atlantic plantations. Dignitaries, there are usually some ambassadors from West African countries, for example, and guests such as yourselves to make sure that these people are never forgotten again. Then in 2014, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association decided that one way we could honor those buried here is to document the number and location of their graves. You might see string uh, where there are graves. That's an ongoing uh, project. So far, archaeologists have discovered 80 some graves without disturbing any human remains. You only have to dig a few inches before the color and the density of the soil clearly defines a grave. So I'm inviting you to participate in something we do daily here, an effort to bring these people to mind, to say their names. And to do that, I've asked for some volunteers to read brief, brief profiles of some of the enslaved people here at Mount Vernon. Could you come forth now, please, here? It is my pleasure to celebrate the life of Nancy Carter Quander. Nancy Carter lived and worked at River Farm. At age 16, she was among the enslaved people emancipated in George Washington's will. Carter eventually married Charles Quander, a free black man from Maryland and a member of one of the oldest African-American families in America. Nancy Carter Quander returned to Mount Vernon in 1835 to cook for the former slaves and their relatives who landscaped around Washington's new tomb. Descendants of the Quander family continue to live in the local area today. Today, we remember Nancy Carter Quander. It is my pleasure to celebrate the life of Rachel. Rachel lived at Mansion House Farm. She was the daughter of Carolyn, Caroline Branham, a housemaid, and Peter Herdeman, the groom who oversaw the stables. Rachel had five siblings. Rachel may have carried large pails of water around the estate, gathered sticks for firewood, and cared for her younger siblings while her parents worked. After George and Martha Washington died, Ra Rachel and her family moved to Arlington House. Today, we remember Rachel. It is my pleasure to celebrate the life of Penny. Penny lived in a cabin on Doge Road Run Farm with her mother Priscilla and five siblings. Her father, Joe, lived and worked on Mansion House Farm. He visited his family on Saturday nights and Sundays. 
Penny did chores such as fetching water, gathering sticks, and watching her three younger brothers while her mother and two older sisters worked. Today, we remember Penny. And now lay this wreath at the memorial as a sign of our respect. And take a brief moment of silence. So music is used to communicate, to comfort those who are mourning, to celebrate a life, to send a code, steal away to Jesus, an escape song. Someone's passing away. Music is very powerful. I want to share a few words with you that were spoken here. And, uh, and this place is tough. Sometimes you're very emotional. It can be a place of pain, a place of prayer, a place of peace and reconciliation and healing. In 1990, the first elected African-American governor, Douglas Wilder, was at this very location. And he said some very stirring words. I'd just like to share a little excerpt with you. For those persons whose backs ache at the end of the day, but nothing like their souls, wealth lay not in worldly possessions, but in that abundance of love, faith, and hope burning deep from within, forever sustaining them until the day of promise upon the horizon. Today, we stand at the site of what many of our ancestors believed to be the gateway to such a day. And although their individual graves may bear no markers, their individual lives left a legacy of their own. But more than a few also believed in and fought for their freedom in this lifetime. And all those have taken the civil war and mass movements and civil protests, we have succeeded in making many necessary and significant changes. Like many of you, I remain ever mindful of the stands and sacrifices made by those who lie herein and by countless others from all walks of life over the course of many years. Indeed, I owe no small debt to the spirit and to the determination of such brave souls. Today on Juneteenth, I'd like to play a special song. Uh, the song is very well known in the African American community, but it's a song for the human race. It speaks of of lifting our voices and sing. Working here at Mount Vernon, I live in two different worlds. So I have slavery in my ancestry and my background, Kenyan, Nigerian, and I also uh, am a military man. I did 30 years in the Army. I served in a unit that would have served under General George Washington. My great, 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 great grandfather was in the Revolutionary War. So um, may I get to bring these worlds together and honor and respect those who lie here. I'll close out with this song.
Thank you all for being here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. You're, you're taking an interest in these people today. It gives their life the dignity uh, that was denied them in their own times.